Our first topic today is oxygen therapy in hypoxic patients. Our speaker is Dr. Saek Khan, who is a senior intensivist from New South Wales. Good morning, everybody. Um, Dr. Saek Khan is my name. Uh, I'm one of the intensive care specialists in uh, Blacktown Hospital. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk on oxygen delivery systems that we use in our healthcare. Um, So we'll talk about a few vital points. Um, then we'll talk uh, uh, on the various devices that we use. Um, we'll talk a bit of advantage, disadvantage, and potential complications um, of all those devices. Before starting, I want to make a few points. Hypoxia kills, hyperoxia does not, at least not immediately. Sorry, hypercarbia does not. So at least not immediately. Why I say this, I find so many times people are scared to give oxygen on really hypoxic patients uh, in the fear that that will push the CO2 up. It can happen, but if somebody is hypoxic, that's going to kill the patient much faster. Any confusion, we suggest we should give oxygen. Hyperoxia or too much oxygen, on the other hand, is again not uh, good for the body. It is harmful, but not if for a short period of time. A patient who is in respiratory distress, their um, minute ventilation load is very high. So we need to keep that in mind to give them uh, give oxygen to these people. The only device that protects the airway um, that we will talk today, um, invasive ventilation is the only one. These are the types of um, uh, devices that uh, we can use. Um, first few can be used in spontaneous bre spontaneously breathing patients. And the last three uh, can be used if patient is not spontaneously breathing. Nasal cannula is the um, first one, very simple. We call it low flow nasal cannula. So oxygen is delivered via two soft cones inserted into the anterior nerves. Um, which, uh, uh, where the oxygen is mixed up with the room air. That is why um, concentration of the oxygen delivered to the patient, the FiO2 fraction of inspired oxygen is notoriously de dependent on respiratory rate, tidal volume, um, oxygen flow rate, and extent of mouth breathing. Um, oxygen fl flow, if we give more than two or, uh, or four liters, that can be very irritating for the nose and can even cause uh, nose bleeding. Um, that's why uh, we can use this only if somebody needs a low FiO2. The good thing is that it's very lightweight, it's inexpensive, it can, patient can be mobile and patient can eat and drink and talk and communicate. So it's just, that's why it's just simple and easy to use. Um, there are limitations. You cannot use this device if somebody needs a bit higher oxygen supply. Um, and definitely it's tricky if somebody is breathing to the mouth. You can give up to 36% uh, oxygen by four liter per minute, but again, this is notoriously unreliable. Partially re rebreathing system. So there are two masks available, Hudson mask and Venturi mask. Why we say partially rebreathing? because we can rebreathe our own exhaled air through this mask. The Hudson mask, uh, simple face mask, this probably is the most frequently used device to deliver oxygen in the health system, um, in or out of hospital, whatever. Uh, it loosely fits onto the face with the help of this metal uh, piece um, uh, conformed to the nose. Um, there are some exhalation pores that helps exhale the air out. Usually it's transparent. Um, there are many sizes available and it's very useful if somebody needs moderate amount of oxygen delivery. Uh, the disadvantage is if somebody is anxious or delirious, you cannot use them, they will just pick it off. Um, and risk of aspiration if somebody is vomiting. One of the important points that we often forget is these devices 
Um, if somebody, uh, if we put somebody on this device, we must not let the flow go below five liters per minute because that lower level of flow, so two liters, three, four liters, um, is not enough to wash away and let our own CO2 go away. Uh, so we can rebreathe our own CO2 and our CO2 may go up. Um, as I said, you can use up to 10 liters per minute with up to 60% oxygen, but it is affected by patient's respiratory status, so not 100% reliable. Venturi mask is the other non rebreather system. Um, again, this uses a simple face mask uh, with this exhalation force, just like um, uh, Hudson mask, the main difference is the connections. So there is a bit of a tubing there, flexible tube, and there is a removable adapter. This adapter uses the Venturi flow system to um, um, maintain fixed FiO2 to the patient. Now, that's why this is called fixed performance system and air entrainment mask. Um, the, the inhaled gas mixture is precisely controlled that it, it can give exactly the amount of FiO2 that, it, that you want to give. The adapter is just changed to, to the set uh, um, uh, FiO2 level. Now, the uh, mask, as I said, similar to Hudson mask. This is the Venturi uh, system, which utilizes various diameters and flow to uh, manage exact, exact amount of um, air and oxygen into the patient. Um, this, this Venturi uh, system or barrel or adapter, whatever you call it, um, uh, it comes in a different system, different way. Uh, sometimes there's one device and you can just uh, dial them up and down. Uh, sometimes you have got a, um, a different adapters with fixed uh, FiO2 that you need to um, change how much you want to give. So if you want to give somebody a 35% oxygen, you need to use a 30, the yellow barrel and line nine liter per minute of oxygen supply from the wall. So it's quite, uh, quite useful in the, in the um, COPD patients where you, uh, you may not want to give too much oxygen. non rebreather mask. Now, this mask is, uh, has got a couple of devices special to it that stops um, uh, inhaling our own exhaled air. So the mask is similar to the um, uh, Hudson mask or Venturi mask with exhalation force. The difference is this uh, device has got a mask and a 2.5 liter um, reservoir bag, which may, keeps a very high level of oxygen there. And there are two um, uh, valves here. One valve is uh, on the uh, exhalation port on one side, not both. And there's another valve between the mask and the bag. So what happens if somebody breathes in, the uh, valve with the bag opens up and lets uh, oxygen come in. And when they breathe out, um, the exhalation valve opens up, let the air out when the, the uh, valve with the back closes so that the exhaled air cannot go into the oxygen reservoir. You can quite reliably uh, provide up to 90% oxygen if you use 15 liters per, 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 per minute of flow. Self-inflating in, um, uh, self or AMBU bag. Um, this, uh, this is a mask, bag mask ventilation device. Um, we pretty much use it for uh, resuscitation purposes in cardiac arrest situation. So um, as you can see, this has got a, a few parts. The mask is like a BiPAP or CPAP mask, um, say, uh, safely fits into the face. Um, there is an expiratory valve where exhaled air can come out of the system. PIP valve, you can dial up and down this PIP up to 20 centimeter water. Uh, which is extremely helpful in a resuscitation status. There is a pop-up valve here, which releases the pressure from the system if the pressure goes too high in the system. Um, self-inflating bag, it just called self-inflating because as soon as you release the pressure, it inflates itself. 
Now, this is about um, one and a half liter uh, uh, volume bag for adult or adult ones. So just be careful when you, we are using it because by vigorously pushing this bag, you can give up to 1.5 liter of, of gas uh, into the patient, which can be damaging to the lungs. Uh, however, um, it is it's an extremely useful uh, system because it uh, self inflates um, and then sucks air from the bag. So there is a 2.5 liter reservoir bag attached to the system and that goes through a oxygen gear connection and a couple of release valves and sockets pretty much used in resuscitation status. Um, I just wanted to remind you about this EC clamp. Yeah, I'm sure you, you know all these things, but look, EC clamp is where, um, how you hold the uh, bag mask to the patient. So little finger goes behind the angle of jaw, um, a ring finger goes below, below the jaw, and middle finger goes uh, below the chin. And uh, index and thumb, um, that creates this C figure to get a good grasp on the bag that gives you good seal. And at the same time, you can do a jaw, jaw manipulation. If this is useful for um, one hand uh, uh, ventilation, if you want to use both hands to get a good grip um, uh, and a good seal on, uh, of the mask on the patient, then you need to get somebody else to use the bag, to push the bag. High flow nasal pumps. Look, this is a game changer. This has changed practice so much over the last few years. Um, pretty much revolutionized the oxygen delivery say, to the sick patients. Um, the oxygen delivery is highly reliable on FiO2. And also, if we use up to 60 liters of flow that we usually use in this, in this device, um, you can create some PEEP, which is really helpful in managing the patient. Um, there has been a large, lot of studies that um, has, uh, has happened uh, around the world with this device, showing mortality benefit, reduced intubation rate, and earlier recovery. Uh, these are a few of the notable studies that has that changed our practice. This mechanism is um, a little bit more complicated. They have got this uh, soft, pliable nasal prongs, which fits in the nose, uh, but these are a uh, higher diameter than the normal nasal prongs. That allows um, high flow to be provided to the patient, up to 60 liters oxygen and uh, air mix. The, there is a heated tubing system. So this tubing is heated and how we heat them up, I'll come on the next slide. Um, there is a humidification device um, that humidifies the air and there is a flow meter. So um, this device, you can give very high level of oxygen. Um, you can use this PEEP effect for pulmonary edema or um, COPD auto PEEP state. Um, you can, uh, uh, it, it can be extremely useful in, in very situ various situations, uh, both type one and type two respiratory failure because that high flow also washes your CO2 out. So tubing is heated by different mechanisms. Some system uses water to heat the air going through that uh, device. And such, some system uses wearing to heat the, uh, heat the air. Airgo is one of those machines, one of the company. Um, there are many companies, there are many machines available, all are equally um, effective. Uh, Airgo is more commonly used, that's why I put it and very easy to uh, manipulate. The soft pliable nasal prong system um, that, that allows the patient to have this high flow, high oxygen, um, patient can eat and drink um, and, and uh, communicate as well. Heating and humidification has got a few advantages. Uh, it facilitates removal of airway secretions, avoids airway desiccation and epithelial injury, decreased work of breathing, and um, all this enhances patient comfort. That washout of the nasopharyngeal airway system through that high flow improves ventilation and oxygen delivery. That PEEP effect I talked about, when you use higher and higher PEEP, higher and higher flow, you can generate up to six centimeters of PEEP, which is really helpful in a COPD patient 
um, and, and, and uh, in decreases the work of brain. Complications or disadvantage is that um, it can cause local nasal injury, epistaxis, it can cause lung injury like barrel trauma. Uh, it cannot mobilize the patient and it is an aerosol generating procedure. So this is a topic that is that has come so popular over the last uh, one year in this COVID situation. Um, aerosol generating procedure um, uh, sort of allows the bug to be spread pretty easily in the room. So using high flow nasal cannula is an uh, aerosol generating procedure. We try to use this um, uh, device only in a negative pressure room in COVID patients. If those fail comes non-invasive ventilation. Um, look, non-invasive ventilation um, uh, is also is very popular. And this is also, there's been a large amount of study which, which shows that it has reduced intubation rate. Um, the gas is delivered via a tight mask um, uh, uh, to the patient from the ventilator uh, NIV machine. This mask has got different types of masks. There are full, full face masks, there are um, a nasal masks, there are half face masks, there are many types available there, uh, depending on the patient. Remember, there is no endotracheal tube in the patient, so airway is not protected. So there are two types available, um, CPAP, that is continuous positive airway pressure, and BiPAP, which is bi-level positive airway pressure, so two pressure levels. Um, I'll first talk about contraindications. So NIV is not intended for full ventilator support. So patients with decreased level of consciousness um, we cannot use NIV because you cannot protect the airways. Um, if somebody is severely hypoxic, you would rather intubate the patient earlier because delaying intubation may worsen outcome. Uh, facial injury, facial deformity may give a mask a misfit. Delirious, confused patient or somebody claustrophobic patient. Uh, I see, I, I've seen people um, hate that mask. Um, patient with copious secretions have got very high risk of acidation because number one, if there is secretion coming in, in the mouth, just mouth secretions, or if somebody vomits, the machine is actually pushing that vomit into the lungs, giving an aspiration. Indications, CPAP is pretty much a type one respiratory failure where uh, carbon dioxide is not issue, CPAP is enough, and BiPAP, we use it for hypercaptic respiratory failure, uh, type two respiratory failure. Um, couple of complications, pressure injury on face, uh, patient cannot eat and drink, uh, patient cannot talk clearly, high pressures can cause barrel trauma, we need to keep that in mind if we use it for a long time. And again, this is another aerosol uh, generating procedure. So BiPAP, um, the difference between BiPAP and CPAP is BiPAP has got two pressure levels, inspiratory positive airway pressure and expiratory positive air pressure. The difference between inspiratory and expiratory air, uh, positive airway pressure is the pressure support. And this pressure support um, uh, helps uh, getting bigger and bigger tidal volume. You can ma manipulate that. And higher the tidal volume, um, higher will be the carbon dioxide clearance. So that's why this is extremely helpful in hypercapnic respiratory failure. If you have got somebody who does not have a, um, a high CO2 level, CPAP is enough, just single pressure level, uh, which is similar thing like EPAP and PEEP. Uh, the, the advantage of PEEP, number one, it opens up more and more alveoli with that pressure, um, which can happen with EPAP, IPAP as well. Uh, that's what we call recruiting more oxygenating surface. At the same time, this extra pressure pushes all the air out of the alveoli, and uh, which is extremely helpful in pulmonary edema state. If all fails come, intense, uh, invasive ventilation in intensive care. Look, um, this is a big subject. Um, I don't think I'm going to go in detail about um, uh, invasive ventilation. If we wish, we can talk, um, we can organize another talk on in, uh, invasive ventilation in future. Uh, the main difference is, the, the, there is an endotracheal tube in the patient which protects the airway and 
um, uh, ensures that you are giving fixed amount of oxygen that you want to give. Maybe 25%, maybe 100%. You can manage that with precise accuracy. Um, you can, if somebody is uh, really hypoxic, like acute respiratory distress syndrome, they need to be intubated with high FRO2 and high flow. You can sedate and paralyze the patient because um, sometimes patient needs multiple interventions in the intensive care and this, um, you can do, it, um, uh, do all those uh, interventions. You can even manage a delivery especially um, or somebody with a decreased level of consciousness has come up after a um, drug overdose or something. We just keep them on a ventilator for a couple of days and then can extubate them. So this is a very reliable device um, and um, a very safe device as well. I think that's it. Um, so I think I've covered most of the things. If you're really interested about invasive ventilation, I can um, organize a talk as well. If any questions, please ask. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sai Khan, for your presentation. Our next presentation is hypertension in pregnancy. Our speaker is Dr. Rubayat Kamal Rimi, who is an advanced training physician from South Australia. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, Federation of Bangladesh uh, Society of Aus Medical Society of Australia, for giving me the opportunity to present today. My name is Rubayat Kamal Rimi, and I'm an advanced trainee currently working at Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'll be presenting today on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. I had an opportunity to work as obstetric medicine advanced trainee, so I'll be using my knowledge today. So. My presentation today is uh, mainly will be focusing on the definition, classification, and the investigations because of the time, time constraint. And if I have time, then I will briefly touch on management as well. So what happens to the blood pressures in pregnancy normally? So in pregnancy, the progesterone hormones actually causes vasodilatations of the blood vessels that results in fall of blood pressures in first and third trimester, uh, second trimester of pregnancy. But by the time you reach the third trimester, the blood pressures actually normalizes to the pre-pregnancy level. So if someone has already high blood pressures in the beginning of the pregnancy, you may find that the, her blood pressure is normalized. And if someone doesn't know that she has high blood pressures in third trimester when the blood pressure normalizes and then uh, it will reach to the pre-pregnancy level, you may find there is new onset of hypertension and that can be mislabeled as uh, preeclampsia. So just be mindful about that. So how to measure the blood pressure in pregnancy as you would do in case of non-pregnant or uh, woman or men, that is in the sitting position, legs lying comfortably on the resting on the flat surface and arms at the level of the heart. Um, sometimes in third trimester of pregnancy or uh, the patient, uh, whoever in um, labor, um, we can measure the blood pressure in lateral recumbency position. Um, but supine posture should be avoided because of supine hypotension syndrome. Um, so the uh, definition of hypertension in pregnancy is the same as you would find in non-pregnant women, that is systolic blood pressures more than 140 and diastolic 110, uh, we call hypertension in pregnancy, but the severity level is a bit different. In case of normal non-pregnant person, we would say that the severe hypertension is leveled as more than 220 millimeter of mercury. But in case of pregnancy, the level is much lower. It is 170 millimeter of mercury because our brain are more vulnerable to the cerebral hypoperfusion in case of pregnancy. So it can cause cerebral hemorrhage, posterior reversible encephalopathy or hypertensive encephalopathy. So that's why we have to be mindful about severity of the hypertension in pregnancy. Um, there are different types of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Um, it can be chronic hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, superimposed preeclampsia on chronic hypertension, and ultimately eclampsia. So I will go a little bit of details on each classification set now. What is chronic hypertension? If you find someone has got um, systolic blood pressure 140 and diastolic of more than 90 um, in before pregnancy or even um, 
before completing 20 weeks of pregnancy, you can call them chronic hypertension. So chronic hypertension can be essential hypertension, which is like normal, you'd see a non-pregnant person. Um, it can be white coat hypertension, or it can be secondary hypertension due to some uh, renovascular disease or endocrine disorders. It is very important to diagnose chronic hypertension because 20 to 25 percent cases it can causes uh, it can uh, progress to preeclampsia. It can also cause intrauterine growth retardation and placental abruption. On the other hand, gestational hypertension is the new onset of hypertension when you diagnose after 20 weeks of pregnancy. And earlier, the presentation, there's more chance that it can go into severity and it can progress into preeclampsia. Now, what is preeclampsia? Um, previously, we used to uh, tell only hypertension and proteinuria and edema as a definition of preeclampsia. But now we know the more about the mechanism of preeclampsia. We now say that preeclampsia is actually a multi-system disorders and it can um, be diagnosed if uh, the hypertension happens more than 20 weeks of pregnancy and associated with any of the organ involvement. For example, in case of kidney, it can cause significant proteinuria. What do you mean by significant proteinuria? If um, when someone comes to your office and you dipstick the urine and you find that one plus protein um, and you have to send it to the uh, protein creatinine ratio um, if it's more than 30 milligram per millimole and it's called significant protein urea. If the creatinine level is more than 90, um, you can also label as um, one of the criteria for preeclampsia. The preeclampsia can affect the hematological systems of the body. Um, if uh, imagine a stiff blood vessel and you're pushing a blood uh, through that vessels and narrow vessels, it can cause damage or destructions of the red blood cell. So you can find in the peripheral blood film, there is red cell fragments or schistocytes. Um, because of the damage, you can have raised bilirubin, raised LDH, and um, endothelial damage can cause a platelet um, uh, consumption, and that's why you can find thrombocytopenia or disseminated intravascular coagulations. In the liver, it can actually cause endothelial leakage of the blood vessels, and that can cause hemorrhage and hematoma development, stretching of the liver capsule, and can cause epigastric pain, right upper quadrant pain, and raised transaminases. In the brain, of course, because of the hypertension, it can cause vasospasm or vasodilatation. And each of them can result in cerebral hypoperfusions or cerebral hemorrhage, can cause convulsion, hyperreflexia, headache, blurring of vision, and ultimately stroke. In the lungs, uh, due to endothelial leak, it can cause interstitial fluid retention and cause pulmonary edema. In terms of fetus, it can cause fetal growth restriction. Now, what would you do if someone comes to your clinic with um, hypertension in pregnancy? Um, you would do something for mother and something for baby. So for mother, you, of course, in the office, you can do an office urine dipstick test and send the urine for spot urine PCR. And in the blood, we'll be doing full blood count, looking for low platelet count, red blood cell fragments or schistocytes, um, and we will send it for electrolyte, urea, creatinine, and liver function tests to monitor the renal functions and liver functions. In terms of baby, we can do an ultrasound, of course, um, and we can see the baby's growth and amniotic fluid volume. There are new investigations that are coming in um, to uh, help with the diagnosis of preeclampsia. And among them, a very new thing that has come to preeclampsia diagnosis is soluble fleet one and placental growth factors. I'll be describing a bit more onto this because it's a new test and it will be coming soon to uh, diagnose the preeclampsia earlier. So what happens in case of normal person is our 
the placental trophoblast releases some angiogenic factors. Uh, placental growth factors is actually causes the vasodilatation. In this illustration, you can see the blue circular um, stuff is the placental growth factors. And, and attached with the endothelium, you can see a, a receptor. It's called FLIT1. And the semicircular portions of the FLIT1 is called soluble FLIT1. And this soluble FLIT1 is actually can circulate in the blood freely. But if it attaches to the placental growth factors uh, before even attached to the receptors, then this placental growth factor cannot attach with the receptors. So what happens? Normally, in normal pregnancy, the placental growth factor, when it attaches to the FLIT1 receptors, it causes vasodilatation. But in case of preeclampsia, uh, pre patient, the trophoblast releases more the soluble fleet and uh, less placental growth factors. So all the soluble fleet is actually attaches to the placental growth factors even before they attach to the receptors. That's why they cannot um, uh, attach to the receptors and they cannot do vasodilatation. In results, they cause vasoconstrictions. So that's results in preeclampsia. So what will you find in case of preeclampsia is that soluble fit one receptors go, um, uh, goes up and placental growth factors goes down. So by looking at the imbalance of the serum concentrations of that, we can actually diagnose someone who can have preeclampsia even even five weeks before the occurrence of it. Um, it. It is shown in a study, it's called prognosis study, is uh, we can actually diagnose preeclampsia, someone's at risk of preeclampsia, even before five weeks. Um, so when do we check that? We check that in 20 to 37 weeks of gestation um, as someone who is at risk of preeclampsia with at least one warning sign. For example, someone with having gestational hypertension, someone has previous history of preeclampsia or family history of preeclampsia. This test is intended to aid the clinician to decide whether you can keep her at home or transfer to the hospital. For example, if you find that these levels are less, the ratio is low, then you can just, okay, I will monitor every weekly and see how she goes and if the levels are increasingly up there is a chance that the, the patient may develop preeclampsia in like subsequent weeks so you can refer them to the tertiary level hospital and it can be also used to anticipate the fetal maternal complication as well so i haven't seen them widely used yet but I think these are coming in and it will be very useful for um, uh, patients who are actually living in rural area so to detect the, whether the patient has been developing preeclampsia or not. So on, in terms of ongoing investigation, what would you do if someone comes into your office pregnant with chronic hypertension? So every time they come to visit, we would be doing to uh, at least urine dipstick and send off the urine for urine PCR and a preeclampsia bloods. Uh, whenever you see that, okay, sudden rise of blood pressure or new kind of protein urea, you will be sending the preeclampsia blood. If someone has gestational hypertension, they are already in high-risk clinic, of course. Uh, we'll be assessing protein urea and preeclampsia blood every weekly. And if someone has preeclampsia, we'll do the urine dipstick every week uh, and urine check for protein urea, sorry, daily and urine um, check every day. Uh, every day and preeclampsia blood at least twice a week before we deliver the baby. Okay. Um, just a brief touch on management. Um, we know that a lot of antihypertensive medications we cannot use in pregnancy, especially angiotensin receptors, um, uh, blockers, uh, is ACE inhibitors, they can cause uh, fetal death and neonatal renal failure. Beta blocker, they can cause growth restrictions. Diuretics, they have got a lot of other side effects as well. So, but they are centrally acting other antihypertensive um, and calcium channel blocker we can use to treat the chronic hypertension and um, the gestational hypertension. The first line of medication that we use is methyl dopa, labetolol, uh, oxprenolol, and uh, we can also use hydrolazine, nifedipine, and prazosin to treat the hypertension. But 
be mindful if someone develops preeclampsia, no matter how much you try to try tightly control the blood pressure. Uh, if you do not deliver the baby, you cannot um, ameliorate the placental pathology. So in that case, delivery is the definitive punishment. So we should refer to the tertiary medical centers for delivery of the baby. If it's early, then um, the obstetrician will try to give steroid for the fetal lung maturations, but um, the delivery is the ultimate options for preeclampsia. Um, so I hope that uh, this presentation helped you to understand a little bit uh, and the new investigations that are coming in from preeclampsia. Um, thank you. These are my reference. Thank you, Dr. Rimi, for your presentation. Our next presentation of the day is a 75-year-old lady with diffuse body ache and new onset headache. Our speaker is Dr. Muklesur Rahman, who is a rheumatologist from Queensland. Thanks everyone for attending tonight's meeting. Um, my topic is a lady who is 75 years old, who did have some aches and pains and some stiffness, now presents with a new onset of headache. So as our theme of the meeting is a diagnostics, but before we go to the diagnosis, always we need to take history, which is a very important part. So how to approach if we uh, uh, go there? History is very important. Type and distribution of the pain. Is it garden distribution? How is stiff is in the morning? And description of the headache. Now headache, is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Is it temporal or occipital? Is there any scalp sensitivity? Is there any visual symptoms? And then also, as always, we need to examine the patient after taking history. Is there a tenderness in the temporal artery? Is there a tenderness in the posteriorly, particularly at the C1 exit foramen as occipital neurology, one of the important differential diagnosis for a unilateral headache? Do not forget to check the uh, visual equity. Particularly, as I'm going to mention the different phenotype of the disease, if there is a large vessel involvement at the time, people can have limb claudication, vascular bruise, discrepancy in the pulse and aortic regurgitation. So from clinical examination point of view, keep that in mind. Other characteristic features of the large vessel affection in the joint lateralite is that it has a stronger female predominance, younger age of onset, and longer time to diagnose because we don't suspect that easily. And inflammatory markers are also a little bit lower than the traditional temporal variety. So as I was talking about clinical examination, which normally we don't consider in this situation, but important to measure the blood pressure in both the arms and cardiac auscultation and a vascular brewing. If we look at the ethnicity, which is a significant risk factor when we think about a joint arthritis, it highest in Scandinavian countries, but people who Scandinavians move to USA, they still carry that higher risk, but very uncommon in Asians and Arabs and African Americans is extremely rare. The, this will be one of the most important slide of this talk because rather than traditional thinking of a cranial variety of temporal arteritis, Nowadays, we are seeing different phenotypes of the disease. Cranial variety, which is the typical temporal artery and jaw claudication and tenderness of the temporal arteries on palpation. There is a extra cranial GCA, which is particularly if you look at this red uh, mark inside the big blood vessels of the aorta and its proximal branches, which is the large vessel variety, as I mentioned before. This is the part which more and more we need to think about because that was not the traditional teaching when we taught in earlier regarding this disease. And other spectrum of the disease, 
what is called imaginary matrix, which stuff I, uh, we are familiar and normally there is no um, headache in that part. So if we look at this uh, one of the paper in British Medical Journal where they distribute the different phenotype symptoms, as you could see that cranial GCA is have headache, but large vessel GCA doesn't have headache. So this is a difficult one to pick up. And jaw claudication is very prominent in cranial GCA, but not in large vessel GCA as similarly visual complications. But if you look at the other features, which sometimes is difficult to pinpoint, think about giant cell arteritis, the fever, weight loss, and the arm claudication, and sometimes out phenomenon, which are very prominent in this phenotype of large vessel GCA. As we are thinking about diagnosis, diagnostic is the theme of this meeting, where is the original criteria when initially we did not consider the large vessel phenotype was that onset more than 50, new onset of headache and abnormal temporal artery and ESR more than 50 and which is confirmed by the biopsy. Now new thinking is that more than 50, other than the visual symptoms, the other things which we need to think about the brewing in external carotid arteries and abnormal imaging, which is more and more coming in the diagnosis of the temporal arteritis. Particularly aorta is an important thing to think about because aorta and its primary branches involvement, which could be clinically silent. So isolated large vessel this year patient only can have constitutional symptoms and disease in the aorta could be silent. So without heightened clinical suspicion, it is going to be very difficult to identify. If I look at this uh, publication in 2018 in Journal of Rheumatology, where there's a new algorithm being suspected. If it is traditional uh, predominant cranial symptoms, we consider first investigation other than inflammatory markers is the ultrasound or the biopsy as ultrasound is easy to get, but it depends upon expertise of the ultrasound, how much experience they have looking at the temporal arteritis. Sign we look for is the halo sign, which indicates the edema in the vessel wall. If that is present, we can confirm the GCA, but if not, but still we have high clinical suspicion other than biopsy, we also could go for other type of imaging like a PET scan or MR angiography. But if predominantly patient had extracranial or large vessel GCA, that time ultrasound is, temporal artery is not going to be very uh, effect, um, good investigation at that time, we need to look for more imaging here because aorta and its branches are not a sign that you could consider biopsy. So PET scan, which more and more clinicians are using it, but access and uh, the amount of money patient is spent could be one of significant issue. And MR angiography and CT angiogram would be another uh, investigation to look at. There are uh, pub, um, EULAR, which is the European League of Rheumatology, has recommended now imaging guideline for large vessel vasculitis. And they also, uh, this is a busy slide, but they have mentioned the same thing and cranial uh, variety, ultrasound of the temporal artery. If it is negative, high suspicion, do ultrasound of the black axillary arteries. And if non-cranial variety, go for either MR angiography or PET scan. Now, treatment is simple, as everyone knows that very effective treat on prednisone, but main thing is that go slow. Because if we rapid deduction invariably leads to flare-up, which we want to avoid. So 
simplified. This is a guideline from British Society of Rheumatology, 40 to 60 milligram depending upon the weight, but that need to be continued for up to four weeks so that it inflammation in the large vessel dissolves well. And then reduce by 10 milligram every two weeks till it comes down to 20 and then reduce by 2.5 milligram every two weeks till it come down to 10, and then one milligram reduction each month as like polymyalgia rheumatica. So as you could see that once we have a diagnosis at the time, steroid treatment is at least for minimum 12 months. That indicates significant steroid burden, and most of our patients are elderly in this group. So how to do the follow-up? We normally look for uh, the inflammatory markers and chest radiograph to monitor the aortic aneurysm. As I mentioned that large vessel involvement is significant. So there are now suggestions coming every two years. We may need to consider echocardiography, particularly look at the aortic root if there is any dilatation and if there is any dilatation, that time probably PET scan will be good scan to look at if there is any active inflammation in the vessel wall, which may need consideration of the treatment, but do not forget the bone health as osteoporosis is common side effect of the prednisone we are going to treat. Now looking at the cytokines, now as you know that anti-TNF and blockers of them are very effective treatment in rheumatoid arthritis, but particularly in this carton, look at here, the vascular smooth muscle cells, their IL-6 is very important target here. So people initially thought about, let's try this anti-TNF agents, which many of the trials as first three mentioned here, they have tried, but that did not have any good benefit in um, giant cell arthritis. But tocilizumab, which is interleukin-6 inhibitor, has had a significant benefit, particularly in remission and maintenance of remission and leads to significant reduction of the steroid. Now, this is an important trial. Everyone talks about that when it comes to giant cell arthritis with the GECTA trial where tocilizumab being um, looked at, particularly tocilizumab comes in subcut 162 milligram every week, which is significantly better than uh, prednisone. And if we look at this graph, which is the top one, which is the tocilizumab weekly, which is significantly different from all other arms where and it maintained up to one year. And as in this cartoon, the third column, which is the tocilizuma weekly, which is maintaining the remission, which is sustained up to one year. So question comes, what happens after one year? So people looked at up to three years of data and that benefit is persistent if we continued, but the currently, in PBS, we don't have permission to use it over one year. So because of the time limitation, uh, take home message, think about different phenotype of the disease in comparison to the traditional uh, cranial variety, think about the large vessel disease. That way we need to be examining differently and follow up a little bit differently. And think about imaging is taking more and more role in giant cell arteritis, such as biopsy of the temporal artery. If it is negative, a strong suspicion, biopsy of the axillary, no, ultrasound of the axillary, not the biopsy, ultrasound of the axillary artery, and then MR and geography or CT, PET CT scan is still biopsy is the gold standard. And other than prednisone, which is needed, but tocilizumab is a new treatment, and that significantly reduces the steroid burden.
Thanks very much everyone for listening. I, because of this very quick presentation, I'll be happy to take questions when we have a question and answer session at the end of all the presentations. Thank you, Dr. Rahman, for your presentation. Our next presentation is assessment of menorrhagia in different age groups. Speaker, Dr. Sonia Hussain, who is a gynecologist from ACT. My name is Sonia Hussain. I'm one of the consultants in Calvary Bruce Public Hospital. I also work in Queen Vian Hospital. I'm the Education Secretary for Bangladesh Doctors Association of Canberra. So today my topic is menorrhagia. So I'm going to talk about the menorrhagia's definition, what are the common cause and how we can manage menorrhagia in different age group. So I'll start with definition. There are few definitions available. Uh, according to NICE guideline, any amount of bleeding, which is excessive and is affecting uh, women's physical, emotional, social and material quality of life, we can uh, define as a menorrhagia. There's also other definitions available. So normally a woman passes about 30 to 40 mils of blood each month. And if it's more than 80 mils per cycle, then we can define it as a menorrhagia. Or if the bleeding lasts for more than seven days, or if it's coming every three weeks, that also can be defined as a menorrhagia. Presentation, usually they come with heavy bleeding. Um, this, um, normally they say they're soaking pad pretty quickly, they, if they can't use tampon because it soaks out uh, straight away. They need to change clothes at nighttime if it's so heavy. They also sometimes present with uh, symptoms of anemia, feeling dizzy, tired, short of breath and chest pain. So if they have severe anemia leading to heart failure, then they can present with this kind of symptoms. If you think of cause, there are a few different cause uh, can cause menorrhagia. Some is hormonal abnormality. So if it's an ovulatory cycle, that can be one of the common cause of menorrhagia. It also, if someone had thyroid, uh, hypothyroidism, that can lead to heavy bleeding. If there's any pathology in the uterus, that also leads to menorrhagia, and that's very common. This is the most common cause. Blood disorder. If someone on blood thinner or if anyone had a kidney or liver disease, uh, altered the coagulation profile, that also can lead up to menorrhagia. If you think about hormonal related problems, so polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome, usually women come with oligomenorrhea. So they have less bleeding per year, but when they bleed, it doesn't stop. So sometimes they can bleed for four to six weeks in a row. Perimenopausal and um, adolescence. So you, these are the two types. Women usually have an ovulatory cycle, can lead up to menorrhagia. Underactive thyroid is another common cause. Uterine pathology, so fibroid, which is quite common, uterine endometrial polyp, adenomyosis, uh, if there's any endometrial cancer or precancers changes. So that can also present with heavy bleeding. If someone on blood thinner, if someone had a history of clot, they're on warfarin or rivaroxaban, this, this, this is also very common findings. Um, uh, women of age of 40 or 40 plus. So we normally don't see this kind of thing in young women or liver and kidney conditions. So this is also a presentation of um, perimenopausal women. So now I'm going to start with my cases. So I have three cases and I'll discuss uh, what are the findings and how I have managed it. So, so the number case, case one, so it's a 14 year old girl presented to my room with her mother with heavy irregular bleeding. So I take a detailed history. Her menarche was when she was nine. Her cycle was irregular. And when I talk about how much she bled, she said she passed this clot about two centimeter size and she need to change pad one to two hours. And the bleeding lasts for five to seven days. She didn't have any clinical signs of anemia, which was good. Her pain was minimal. She didn't have any thyroid, um, any evidence of hypothyroidism, no evidence of spontaneous bleeding, no epistaxis, no gum bleeding or no easy bruising. No other past medical history. Doesn't have any family history of polycystic ovarian syndrome either. She was non-smoker and no other recreational drugs. Any adolescent girl, I come to my room, I always try to take some history in absence of her parents. 
to make sure there's no history of domestic violence, any social issues, any sexual abuse. She didn't have any of those uh, risk factor. She didn't have any clinical symptoms of anemia. Most, she all, all she mentioned is heavy bleeding and it's so heavy it is affecting her school performance. So she can't go to school on her day one and day two. So which is quite concerning. I did some basic vital signs. So she had borderline tachycardia, her blood pressure was low and she looked pale and I examined her abdominally and if there was no mass, uh, there was no palpable mass and the uterus was not palpable either. There was no sign of excessive hair growth or hirsutism. So my differentials in this age group, so she was 14. So it's from 11 to 17 to 18 years old girls. Most common cause of heavy bleeding is an evolutory cycle and hormonal imbalance. So most of the period they're having, they're not still not ovulating regularly. And that's causing all these issues. Thyroid disorder is another common cause of heavy bleeding and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, or if there's any clotting disorder, but I was, I was more concerned of an evolutory cycle and hormonal imbalance for her. Her him, I organized an investigation. Her hemoglobin was 105. She was O positive blood group. Her iron study showed severe iron deficiency anemia. Thyroid function were normal. Coagulation profile was normal. One willibrand factor. So this is something we order in adolescent girl if they come with hemorrhagia. Her abdominal ultrasound was uh, normal. Her beta HCG was negative. So there's three different, we explained three different ways. So mild, moderate, and severe. So she fall into the category of moderate, um, moderate heavy bleeding and uh, so we need to stop give some medication to stop it so we talked about a few different options so first we treat her iron deficiency by giving her oral supplement ferrograts one tablet daily and discussed about non-hormonal and hormonal treatment she already tried non-hormonal method and her gp started her on cranestomic acid and she also tried mephenomic acid so she used it for two months, but it didn't help. And that's why she, is, um, she came to my room. I discussed about starting her on some hormonal treatment uh, to, for the heavy days. We, I discussed to give her norethesterone or medroxyprogesterone acetate. So these, these are the two are progesterone hormones and we, um, the norethesterone come as a uh, primolate end and medroxyprogesterone we can find as a primary. Oral contraceptive pill, because we need to give her something to control it for long term. And implanon, if nothing works. So for her, as she already tried NSAIDs and tranexamic acid, and then we talked about uh, start her on hormone uh, therapy. When she came to my room, she was not bleeding. So I put her on oral contraceptive pill and advised her we need to wait for at least three months to, to see the actual result. So she came back to my room a few weeks later and advised that she tried the pill for two weeks and couldn't tolerate it due to severe nausea. And once she stopped the pill, she had heavy bleeding end up in hospital. And then her GP called me to see her urgently. So when she came to my room, she was bleeding quite heavily and, uh, and she, can, she didn't stop. So I, I gave her Primolat, one five milligram three times a day to stop the bleeding. And I also discussed about implanon because we need to do something for the long term. She is happy to try for implanon and she came back in a week time and I put the implanon in. Six weeks later, she presented to my room again. According to her, her and her mom, the bleeding stopped. However, she couldn't tolerate the significant mood swing and she felt suicidal. So she, they were desperate to have the implanon out. So I did to have a long discussion because we need to come up with a plan because she is switching home on one after another and it, that usually doesn't help. So, but she finally agreed she will try the mephenemic acid and tranexamic acid and see how she goes. So it's been eight months now, I haven't heard from them, which is a good thing. The anovulatory cycle, it usually resolves when they uh, reach the age of 17 and 18. And it's important to counsel them because if they switch from one treatment to another, it doesn't work. If we start tranexamic acid, it, if we give it for three months, usually it gets better and it has a bit of better control. So it's very important they stick to the one treatment and we'll go from there. But practical life is different because they get very anxious, end up in hospital and keep um, requesting different type of treatment. So, but finally, she is happy with simple things and she 
hasn't seen me since then, which is good. So the second case I'm going to discuss about, uh, that she is a 39 year old lady presented to my room with history of heavy bleeding and her bleeding was continued for eight months. She was admitted to emergency department three months ago with a fainting episode. And when they, she went to the hospital, um, she was bleeding 60 days in a row. Her hemoglobin found to be 43 and rest of the blood coagulation profile and everything was normal. She was not pregnant at that time. They organized an emergency ultrasound and which showed thickened endometrium. She received two units of blood in emergency and then she was discharged to see a gynecologist as an outpatient. So when she arrived, I took a detailed history. Her menarche was age of 13. Her cycle always been irregular and heavy. She always passes clot, but she thought it was normal. And if in her heavy day, she only need to take two neurofen. Her, but nowadays the bleeding become more heavy and she need to change bed every 30 minutes. She also have shortness of breath and dizziness. She feel excruciating pain when she passes clot. There was no pressure symptoms. There was no symptoms of urinary retention or change of appetite or loss of weight. She has been married for nine years. She didn't have, never had a children and she tried for a baby but never conceived. No history of sexually transmitted disease. She had with the same partner for nine years. She never had cervical screening test. She only she was only 39, but she had made significant medical uh, illness, polycystic ovarian syndrome, psoriasis, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. She was uh, and had a tonsil and adenoidal surgery when she was young. She was on metformin one gram daily and telmisurtin for 40 milligram daily. She was a social drinker and non-smoker. I examined her, so she looked pale and she had a male pattern of boldness. She has significant acne problem and uh, the, uh, there was excessive hair growth on her teen. I, I did a gentle speculum, her cervix looked normal. I took her cervical screening test. On bimanual examination, her uterus was bulky. It was not tender, cervical excitation was negative. I did a bedside ultrasound. Her endometrial looked slightly thickened and mild irregularity was present. So my differential was possibly an ovulatory cycle due to polycystic ovary, and she might have fibroid because the uterus felt bulky. It could be endometrial polyp or hyperplasia. So we organized some blood tests. So her hemoglobin currently was 60. Her ferritin was significantly low. Her thyroid function was normal. Her other electrolytes, kidney and renal function was normal. Coagulation profile was normal too. I organized an ultrasound, which showed some um, endometrial fibroid, and which is only two by two, which is small. And the endometrial thickness was upper limit of normal, only 16 millimeter. So I was not too concerned about her. However, during, uh, so I booked her for his, I give us a few options. So if anyone comes with menorrhagia, we can discuss a few options. Number one is to try the marina. If the family is complete, then we can talk about endometrial ablation. So as her family is not complete and she was planning for babies. So we didn't, uh, we only um, discuss uh, hysteroscopy DNC and Marina to control the bleeding. Then we can uh, treat her fertility. Then we can focus on her fertility concern. So during hysteroscopy, and that's, that's the picture I saw. So it's very irregular and quite vascular. And I was not expecting to see that. However, that's what I found. And I took a good amount of curating and put the Marina in. Unfortunately, the curating confirmed she had endometrioid adenocarcinoma. When I discussed the result with her, of course, she was devastated and, and it's quite shocking for her. A uh, few things we need to think about if anyone come with heavy bleeding, these are the few criteria we need to uh, focus on. So if anyone over the age of 45, overweight, more than 90 kilo, never had any children, any history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, any family history of endometrial ovarian or bowel cancer, they are increased risk of endometrial cancer. So she has polycystic ovary. She was more than 90 kilo and never had children. So she had few risk factor, which, um, which I finally noticed once I see the histopathology, because initially I was not concerned about cancer. So the treatment will depend on the cause. So of course it's a cancer. So I discussed we need to organize a hysterectomy to take the tubes and ovary out. And she was quite upset and she was crying. So I have discussed her case with the gynecology oncology team in Sydney and also have discussed her case with hematology because hemoglobin was significantly low and it's very difficult to stop her bleeding. 
I also have referred her to the IVF, uh, Westmead IVF uh, Australia to discuss about the fertility concern because she is still very keen to have her baby. I um, organized few further testing. So uh, tumor marker is one of the important investigation we do uh, once we found endometrial cancer to see if it's spread to the ovary or not. So her tumor marker came back normal, which is reassuring. Her CT scan, there was no evidence of metastasis. MRI also showed there was no retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. So according uh, staging was, it was FIGO stage 1A. Um, so she has been seen by gynae oncology team in Sydney, and she also seen by Westmead Hospital uh, IVF clinic. So after having long discussion, the gynae oncology team advised to put her on high dose of progesterone, 200 milligram progesterone pressure every day, and continue with the marina. And the plan was to do um, endometrial sampling every three months and to see uh, if it's resolving or not. If it's the plan was if it's not resulting after two hysteroscopy, we should go ahead with the hysterectomy. And if it's show any sign of um, improvement, we will continue until it's negative, and then we can try the IVF um, cycle with Westmead Hospital. So after doing three total three hysteroscopy DNC over eighteen months, her learning normalized, and she was delighted after she saw the result. And now she's currently have, go, having her IVF cycle through the Westmead Hospital. And I'm waiting to see what the outcome is. So this is the, another thing I just, uh, re reason I presented because uh, in the, uh, if you look at the ultrasound, it sometimes looks normal. And I have seen this happen to three of my patients, borderline raised uh, thick endometrium uh, presented with menorrhagia and they come back cancer before menopause. So they are not postmenopausal. They're around their forties and, uh, and it's quite shocking result. But with the endometrial cancer, surgery actually gives a very good result. So if we can diagnose it early, that, that helps them a lot. So my third presentation, the third case is a 27-year-old female who presented with menorrhagia and the ultrasound showed multiple fibroid and the endometrial thickness was 36 millimeter and with irregular margin. So I was more concerned about this woman. And so she's, I saw her urgently and take a detailed history. So her menarche was uh, when she was age of 11, her cycle always being regular, but she bled heavily every time. For the past three months, she bled continuously. She passes clots every time she goes to the toilet and she needs to pay, change pad every three to four hours. She didn't have any symptoms of anemia, so not short of breath or dissonance. Only if she no, complained of lower back pain, so dragging sensation um, and very severe pain during her cycle. She also mentioned increased frequency of urine. There's no evidence of retention no change of appetite, no weight loss. She never been sexually active, never had cervical screening test, no other medical illness, never had any surgery. She was on Primulat five milligram three times a day. She has seen by another gynecologist in the past and they um, two years ago, and she had a ulipristal for three months. So ulipristal is a drug we use to shrink the fibroid, but we can use it only for a short period of time. And the problem with this drug, when we stop it, the fibroid keep getting bigger and go back to its normal size. So we only use it before surgery to shrink the uh, fibroid, so to make the hysterectomy easier. She was a non-smoker and never had. Um, in, she's not a. Um, she never drinks alcohol. She, on examination, she looked anemic. The uterus was bulky, about sixteen weeks size, and she declined any internal examination. My differential for her was most likely fibroid because it's a big uterus. It could be endometrial hyperplasia. As the endometrial lining was so thick, it could be a cancer and hormonal imbalance is less likely because her cycle is always regular. So I organized an investigation. Her hemoglobin was 85. She has severe iron deficiency anemia and other rest of the bloods were normal. Thyroid stimulating hormone coagulation profile. I also did tumor marker because her lining was thick and irregular. Her ultrasound showed 16 week size uterus and endometrium was quite thick and irregular lining. I organized an MRI to make sure I'm not missing anything. So it showed multiple fibroid, no metastatic deposit and only clot inside the uterus. So there was no vascularity on those uh, thickened lining, which is reassuring. I organized an iron infusion and urgent hysteroscopy DNC and insertion of marina. Unfortunately, during hysteroscopy, all I could see is very thick, irregular, looks like blood clot. I took a lot of keratin and I put the marina in. 
However, the histopathology shapes only cloth. There was no endometrial lining found to investigate. So that's quite disappointing. So when I saw her, I again repeat the tumor marker. I again organize ultrasound to make sure there's no um, changes from the ultrasound. If anything else we can add on or not. So ultrasound showed the same. The uterus full of clot and there's no marina seam. So she might have expelled the marina straight away. So I organized a second hysteroscopy and DNC in six weeks time. And I finally, I managed to see multiple fibroid and I'm, I excised six of them. However, I couldn't complete the procedure because we have a safety limit of water. So we, we only can use two and a half liter water. Otherwise they can have water intoxicated or oh, intoxicity. So um, after taking uh, as much fiber as I can, then I put the marina in. Histopathology showed benign in uterine fiber. There was no evidence of cancer. So that's reassuring. However, the, even after taking that many fiber and um, putting the marina, she continued to bleed. The bleeding never stopped. She was on premolot on the top of uh, the marina, but still her hemoglobin dropped to 55. She has been seen by a hematologist uh, to see if there's anything else we can do to control her bleeding or maintain her hemoglobin. And the hematologist called me for an urgent review. So I saw her again and I did repeat her bloods and it was 62 and our deficiency anemia was present. She had iron infusion a few times, but still she continued to lose blood. The ultrasound showed 15 week size uterus with multiple fibroid. No marina visualized again. So I then I have a long discussion. As she never been sexually active, she still uh, have a strong desire to start her family. Um, I advise that there's few options we can do. We can do the same procedure, hysteroscopy resection of fibroid, myomectomy or hysterectomy if the bleeding cannot be stopped. She's not very keen on any invasive surgery. So we, we agreed to, upon to do a hysteroscopy DNC and resection of fibroid. This time I also consented her to do a laparoscopy so that we can complete the procedure and make sure the bleeding stops. So another eight fibroid I have resected and she lost about one liter of blood in theater and we managed to normalize the cavity, which was reassuring. So at the end, the cavity looked normal. And um, so we have, I have given her two units of blood in theater. I started her on depot provider injection because the marina is not staying in. So we, we started the medical, like, you know, other progesterone hormone to see if that works. And I have seen, seen her in six weeks times after the third surgery and he, her hemoglobin the, for the first time in three months, it went up to 116. She also seen by hematologist and she was quite impressed with the hemoglobin as well. And I haven't seen her since then. So that's, that's a good outcome, I would say. And she was happy and hopefully she'll find a partner and can start her family. So the reason I picked these three cases so that we can, I can cover most of the common causes of menorrhagia and also to address that if even if, if they're perimenopausal with the borderline thick and lining, it can be something nasty. So we, we need to investigate it as soon as possible. Any women bleed, any postmenopausal bleed, any women bleeding after the age of 55, that's abnormal. So they need to be investigated straight away. So these are the three cases. And if anyone have any question about um, menorrhagia, and please feel free to uh, ask me questions at the question and answer time. Uh, it's Sonia Hussain um, from Calgary Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Our next presentation is FBMSA President's Invitational Lecture. Our speaker is Dr. Shahid Haq who is a pediatrician and head of the Department of Pediatrics, Latro Regional Hospital from Victoria. He is going to speak on a seven-year-old boy with heart murmur. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you a topic um, that is heart murmur in a seven-year-old child. Uh, my name is Shahid Haq. I'm a pediatrician and the head of the Department of Pediatrics at La Trobe Regional Hospital. I was the former head of the Department of Pediatric Cardiology at uh, Wentworth Specialist Hospital and Albert Lutley Central Hospital in Durban. Now, murmur is fairly common uh, problem, but Surely it is not a disease or diagnosis. 
um, rather it's a sp specific uh, sound that comes from the heart and we call it murmur. The murmur can be due to many different reasons and murmur can be normal too. So a seven-year-old child who has a heart murmur, and if you have encountered with the child for the first time, um, now it is your and my responsibility to solve this problem. So the problem solving exercise I have divided into three stages. Firstly, we need to assess and evaluate this child with heart murmur. Therefore, we do need to know uh, detail but comprehensive history and then proceed with the clinical examination once we have completed that, then we need to um, think about what is really causing this murmur. Once we have done that, then our task would be what to do with the child or your action plan. Now, first thing of that is the history taking. Now, unlike many other conditions, the parents will not be able to tell you that my child has a heart murmur because they won't know unless uh, a doctor previously has told them. So it's our duty when we listen to uh, and examine the child, whether he has a murmur or not. But assuming the child has already a murmur, how and why this murmur is, that's what would be our responsibility to find out. So in the history, first thing we need to uh, ask the question to the parents whether they knew anything about the mama. That means whether this is a pre-existing mama or is this a new onset mama? Now a pre-existing mama, probably if it is present, likely to be present from infancy or um, subsequently somebody heard, and a new onset murmur that was not present in infancy or um, in early childhood. Second question you need to ask whether the child is symptomatic one way or other or completely asymptomatic. Children often don't complain and their subtle symptoms can completely go unnoticed. Um, however, sometimes they may have some degree of exercise intolerance. For example, if a child who has a five millimeter size ASD, he won't have any other symptoms or specific signs, but there may be exercise intolerance. A child may also be completely asymptomatic with um, some um, congenital or acquired heart disease as well. Next, we need to find out um, whether the child has any uh, or had any features of acute rheumatic fever at any stage uh, in his life, though rheumatic fever, uh, very uncommon before the age of five years. Um, once we have obtained a comprehensive uh, history about the child, we now need to examine the child. When we are examining the child, particularly for the cardiovascular reason, it's critically important that the environment has to be very quiet. Um, it is not uncommon when you are examining the child or particularly listening uh, or auscultating the child, uh, everybody start talking. Um, if the environment is not quiet and uh, people are talking, you'll be missing some of the subtle or soft uh, murmur, which may be very significant. So during examination, we need to understand if the child is well-looking or if 
is unwell looking child. Um, well versus unwell looking child may indicate different kind of problems. We also need to know whether the child is cyanotic or acyanotic. And when I'm talking about cyanosis, I, want, I mean uh, central cyanosis. Now, if a child's saturation is low 90s or upper 80s, a child may not look cyanotic, particularly if the child is also um, mildly anemic. Here, an oxygen saturation is critically important. Ideally, the oxygen saturation uh, must be taken both preductal and postductal. We need to know the weight, the heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure of the child. And once again, we need to know what is the uh, um, average weight, heart rate, respiratory rate, and systolic blood pressure for that particular age. We need to do the uh, comprehensive general examination and particularly look for any evidence of finger clubbing. Um, pulse is critically important. Uh, depends on the age of the child, um, either radial, but sometimes uh, brachial pulse is better, uh, more so in very young uh, child or infant. Character of the pulse, etc. Nowadays, uh, not critically important because of all sorts of high tech machines and other things. But what is very important is to feel the radial pulse, uh, uh, sorry, femoral pulse, and compare the radial, uh, femoral, or brachial and femoral pulses together. If the femoral pulse is extremely weak, uh, or impalpable, then there is likely only one condition go with that, and that would be the coarctation of the aorta. And if the child has coarctation of the aorta, unlikely there will be any murmur, but there will be no other clue either. Next, we need to look at the precordium. If there is any bulge, if there is a bulge, particularly the left side of the precordium, and the sternal area, it does indicate that there, and there is cardiomegaly. And then uh, lay your hands on the precordium to feel if there is any heave or any thrill. Uh, if there is palpable thrill, that indicates the uh, murmur is at least um, grade four. It's very important to feel the suprasternal notch and sometimes the carotid artery. Um, and if there is a thrill, uh, that almost always indicates left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, more commonly aortic stenosis. As you know, um, you probably see um, some patients uh, with this problem in adults. Next, you are auscultating for the heart sounds, um, S1 and S2. S2 is critically important for us um, in children uh, because the S2 can give us uh, a lot of clue and even diagnosis. For example, if a child has a modest size uh, ASD, his S2 is likely to be um, wide split and fixed um, with soft ejection systolic murmur along the left sternal edge. Uh, this will also be the case if uh, there is similar conditions. Next, we need to um, understand if there is any abnormal heart sounds, that means additional heart sounds, S3 and S4. Um, remember, the S3 uh, can be uh, normal in uh, young children, but the gallop rhythm may indicate the uh, possibility of the uh, heart failure. Once we have done the um, um, examination and we have taken the history, now 
uh, we going to uh, analyze this murmur. The murmur always need to be correlated with the cardiac cycle. So therefore, is this murmur happening in systole or in diastole, or both in systole and diastole? Or is this murmur continuous? Each of these murmurs actually uh, narrows down the probable diagnosis. On the other hand, the murmur may be completely innocent, um, but uh, to be able to say this is an innocent murmur, one must have um, experience. Uh, and in children, we do not want to dismiss any murmur as innocent unless proven otherwise. Next about the murmur is uh, if it is systolic, we need to grade the murmur. Systolic murmur is graded between one and six. And grade one murmur is difficult to uh, appreciate. Um, grade two or grade three be subjective and grade four has a hallmark of um, palpable thrill. Um, Anything, if you, if you feel a thrill, uh, then the murmur, systolic murmur is likely to be grade four or more. Then we need to know the character of the murmur, whether this is, a, um, this is an ejection systolic murmur or is this a pan systolic murmur. Ejection systolic murmur indicates there is uh, resistance um, to the flow of blood through abnormal, uh, valve or hole. We also need to know the location or where the murmur is best heard and if there is any radiation. So let's see how we describe a murmur in one complete sentence. Um, there is a two or three or two to three over six ESM best heard along the left upper sternal edge and radiating to both lung fields um, to the left and to the right. So if I hear uh, someone is talking about this murmur with this complete uh, statement, I would start thinking um, whether the child um, most likely has a pulmonary stenosis. On the other hand, the diastolic murmur is far less common in children and graded from one to four. Once we have um, uh, assessed the murmur, now we need to know if there is any signs of congestive heart failure. In children, the symptoms and signs of the heart failure are different from the adults. Uh, predominantly, children have more respiratory symptoms. More younger, they are more likely to be respiratory rather than the cardiac symptoms and signs. Um, often, they may have exercise intolerance. Um, hepatomegaly is almost always um, is an association with uh, heart failure. Um, persistent tachycardia and um, possibly gallop rhythm plus other signs of typical congestive heart failure depending on the age of the child. When we are evaluating this child we also need to know if there is any signs of acute rheumatic fever at the time of examination. We also need to uh, dis, uh, assess the child um, if there is any evidence of infective endocarditis. This child, with, if a child has infective endocarditis, he will look very sick indeed. Now, what could be the causes of murmur in a seven-year-old child? If the murmur is pre-existing, it's likely to be congenital depends on when this murmur uh, first heard. Um, but if this is a completely new onset murmur, then it is likely to be acquired. 
and the murmur can be innocent, but for anyone to say innocent murmur, he or she must have a clear understanding and a lot of experience. It has got a distinct character, but in children, generally speaking, we don't want um, anyone uh, dismissing a murmur as innocent unless uh, very experienced. Um, otherwise, we may miss uh, congenital or awkward heart condition. So if the murmur is pre-existing and congenital, what are the possibilities? First thing we want to know if the child is asynotic. The child is asynotic, the most common cause uh, would be a left to right shunt. Uh, and that means the VSD, ASD, AV septal defect, and PDA. Um, if it is obstructive, then mm, the coarctation of the aorta and bulb stenosis or regurgitation of both. If the child is cyanotic, the most common cyanotic condition is tetralogy of palate. However, there may be other cyanotic heart disease. In Australia, it would be extremely rare to see a child with congenital cyanotic heart disease um, at the age of seven years and no one know or no one knew about it. Um, not only that, even the asynotic heart disease will probably uh, never go unnoticed. It is still possible, particularly if you are seeing a child who is an immigrant in this country, or if you are working in the Northern part of the country. Among the acquired causes of uh, heart murmur is one, this rheumatic heart disease, and may uh, indicate mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or aortic stenosis. The rheumatic heart disease is very uncommon in Caucasian children, uh, but you will see uh, plenty of them if you are in the northern part of the country. Infective endocarditis, the child will be very sick. It's rare and usually have a pre-existing heart disease and there will be many other uh, clinical signs of infective endocarditis, which I will not be able to cover here. Tumor of the heart is extremely rare in childhood, uh, but myxoma is one uh, is extremely rarely seen as well. Once we have done all these things, we have taken the history, we have examined and we know the child has a murmur and we think the child, child's murmur is, murmur is unlikely to be in, uh, innocent, what we do with it. Well, you cannot do anything with the child uh, other than a referring to a pediatrician or to a cardiac center. I think that's all I will finish here. Thank you, Dr. Hack, for your very nice presentation. Our last presentation of the day is assessment of treatment resistant depression. Our speaker is from Western Australia, Dr. Ahmed Munib, who is a psychiatrist. Hello. Welcome to this talk on treatment resistant depressive disorder. My name is uh, Dr. Ahmed Munib. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in Perth in Western Australia. And uh, this presentation is for the 2021 scientific seminar for the Federation of Bangladeshi Medical Societies of Australia. So just as an overview of depressive disorder in general, it is a significant public health hazard uh, in addition to being a mental health disorder, globally affecting well over 260 million people of all ages worldwide, according to WHO statistics. That's a colossal number when you think about it. It's actually more than 10 times the entire population of Australia. And behind cardiovascular disease and cancer, depression is, or rather has the third highest disease burden in Australia and also globally. It affects mostly young adults, but can actually impact on any age and any background. Although females are twice affected compared to males, according to incidence 
and prevalence rates. We know what depression is, but treatment refractory or treatment resistant depression is another level of complexity, regardless of uh, someone working as a general practitioner uh, or as a specialist psychiatrist, it is a particularly challenging mental health condition. So in 1974, the World Psychiatric Association defined treatment resistant depression as an absence of clinical response to imipramine or an equivalent antidepressant at a minimum dose of 150 milligrams for a period of four to six weeks. Now, bearing in mind that in the early 1970s, tricyclic antidepressants were the mainstay of treatment. Uh, the SSRIs, which were only to be discovered or introduced in the late 1980s, were not available at the time. A re-evaluation of this definition was considered in the late 2000s and around 2008 from the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry who redefined treatment resistant depression as a condition where there was a failure to have adequate response following treatment with physical and psychological therapies. So the issue of psychological treatment was considered as an additional intervention. Regrettably, only 50% of major depression cases will recover satisfactorily, and more than 80% of cases that are treatment resist resistant will relapse within a 12-month period. So what exactly is treatment resistant depression aside from the definition? There are a number of stages which are quite valuable to acknowledge how it is categorized. Uh, stage zero is when the patient has really not had any particular um, satisfactory period of treatment uh, since commencement on an antidepressant. Stage one is a failure from any major class of antidepressant. Stage two is um, stage one plus another antidepressant from a different class, either SSR or SNRI. And then have stage through three, where there's stage two resistance and despite addition of a tricyclic, it hasn't been successful. And then we have stage three, which involves failure of a monooxidase inhibitor, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Stage five is where all the other stages have been unsuccessful and a course of bilateral electroconvulsive therapy has to be considered as a treatment option. So as we can see, there are a number of varieties of stages before we reach the most uh, perhaps uh, resistive stage of stage five. So what could be the reasons for treatment refractory depressive disorder? The obvious one is certainly discontinuation of an antidepressant. We know that antidepressants will take at least two to three weeks, sometimes a bit longer to provide the desired therapeutic effectiveness. And many patients regrettably will stop medication even after a few days of commencing, and then report to the doctor that they haven't responded. But unfortunately, they haven't responded because they haven't given enough time for the medication to exert its necessary effectiveness. Then again, there's the aspect of suboptimal dosage, non-adherence to treatment, misdiagnosis, and comorbidities can be quite significant, such as other mental health conditions, such as personality disorder, an undiagnosed bipolar condition, and some other issue conditions which we've uh, stated here. Um, it is to be considered that if there is a comorbid medical condition, for example, an endocrine disorder such as diabetes or thyroid disorder, or any of those major medical or organic issues, they can actually adversely impact on the recovery and the trajectory of, of the prognosis. Chronic pain can certainly impact on a patient not recovering. And of course, notwithstanding, if a patient has an associated psychosis, which is also undiagnosed, that can adversely impact on their recovery as well. So the strategies in this case would be to increase the dosage of the existing antidepressant, or switch into a different class, or combining different classes, or augmentation with a mood stabilizer, such as lithium carbonate, lamotrigine, and even sodium valproate. In recent years, it has become customary to utilize atypical antipsychotics as augmentation therapies. Noteworthy are lansipine, quetiapine, risperidone, but also in recent years, 
some of the newer generation atypical, such as aripropozole and neuracidone uh, and brexpropozole have also been considered. Now, what happens if these conventional interventions, pharmacological agents do not work, which is a distinct and regrettable possibility? There have been some research studies about the addition of a triiodothoronine, benzodiazepines, but they do have their own risks, stimulant medications, such as dexamphetamines, but they do have risk of dependency. Ketamine has been seen to be quite important, and S-ketamine was recently been introduced as an intranasal spray. There are also some studies which talk about omega-3 fatty acids, methylfolates, and a few other nutritional varieties. But it's important to acknowledge that many of these treatments are augmentation as opposed to standalone. So the primary platform or the basis for treatment does have to be an antidepressant medication, but they can be combined with the list of medications you see on this slide here. Now, what happens if the medications do not work? As we saw in an earlier slide, if we reach stage five of uh, failure, we have to consider ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. ECT is actually quite an effective means of treatment, uh, but it does have an associated stigma attached to it, and it will require significant um, disclosure and um, perhaps uh, psychoeducation with the patient and the carers of families. But the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry, in addition to other international agencies, do strongly endorse um, depressive disorder treatment with ECT because there is significant evidence-based uh, research which advocates in its favor. In fact, even with the best antidepressant treatment, there can be a roughly 60 to 65% recovery rates, according to various uh, Cochrane reviews, but ECT can exert up to 90% success rates in severe depressive disorders. So what happens if uh, ECT is not uh, available or not convenient? Psychotherapy is obviously relevant. And in this case, it has to be at least two trials of 16 hours duration by two different therapists. And one option could be to try different trials of antidepressants, either tricyclics or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, such as moclobamide. Okay. When ECT is considered, just coming back to that, it really is ideal to consider bilateral if the patient can tolerate and at least eight treatments. But usually in our clinical practice, if it's resistant case, we may go up to 12 treatments and then follow up with maintenance therapy either once weekly or once fortnightly. A relatively um, strongly encouraged method of treatment nowadays is RTMS, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is non-invasive. There is no anesthesia involved, and the RNZCIP has also endorsed um, this particular modality of treatment as an effective evidence-based outcome for treatment-resistant depression. RTMS was originally introduced in the middle of the 1980s and has been mostly provided in the public, uh, in the private sector, pardon me, but also in some limited public settings. And what it involves is about 30 to 40 minute sessions every day on a working week, so five days for up to four to six weeks. There is no particular evidence suggesting maintenance RTMS to be particularly valuable. However, uh, some studies where they tried to utilize ECT and RTMS really didn't see any major uh, benefits for that. There is some good news. Until recently, there was no Medicare rebate for RTMS. From 1st of November, RTMS is actually going to be available in the public system. It has to be qualified by a psychiatrist suitably trained in RTMS for adults above the age of 18 years. And there are some uh, particular limitations and criteria. And uh, still, it is encouraging and promising that this is going to be available in a very short period of time in the public system. Just a snapshot of um, an example of someone undergoing RTMS. And then we have a picture of one of the machines, which uh, is also an RTMS machine. So what other treatment modalities might be available in addition to pharmacology, ECT, and RTMS? 
There are some experimental treatments which are not used in the mainstream. Magnetic seizure therapy, which is also non-invasive. Then a focally electrical, focal electrically administered seizure therapy. That's another method of um, electrical induction in the cortex of the brain. Vagal nerve stimulation, that however is quite invasive and deep brain stimulation, which is even more invasive because it involves what is known as a brain pacemaker implanted uh, inside the brain. So where do we stand here? We know that treatment-resistant depression is a particularly challenging and um, significantly complex condition to treat, and it is um, deeply concerning for families and patients when there is limited recovery. So there has to be future research in looking at the trajectories of um, prognosis, tolerability, uh, the impact of inflammatory markers and neuromodulation interventions. I'll finish with an image, um, a rather famous painting, which is actually a favorite of mine. This is a, an artwork by the uh, Dutch painter, Vincent van Gogh, uh, titled, Soaring, man at eternity, Soaring Old Man at Eternity's Gate painted in 1890. Uh, some see it actually a self-portrait of Van Gogh, who tragically died at the age of 37 by suicide. Uh, he reputedly had a very severe mental disorder. Some say it was a, a complex psychotic depression, uh, but then again, we will never know because uh, he was never properly treated during his lifetime. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for listening and uh, for bearing with me. Goodbye.